Actually, just uh, a few years back that we were here at uh, TED Med and saying, you know, we really need an event like this because the world is changing at such an extraordinary rate. Uh, and there's no field that will be more disrupted, more reinvented than medicine this next decade. So first of all, just a word of thank you. I want to thank Daniel. I want to thank Will uh, Weissman, Rob Nail, the entire staff. I mean, isn't this gorgeous? I mean, is this really just a beautiful setup? So, so uh, let's jump in. Uh, I'm excited to share with you. I'm going to take you down a little bit slower than Daniel. Um, and my goal here during this next 30 minutes is to give you a fundamental understanding of why the rate of disruption is going to be so high. I want to go back and talk about what's going on in sort of our technological framework that is changing everything, and how do you think about it? So this is sort of a, a 101 that's gonna be hopefully useful for the rest of the next three days. First and foremost, the thing that I wanna share is that we're all disadvantaged at understanding the rate of change. Uh, as we evolved on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, sort of the hardware and wetware of our brains evolved in a world that was best described as local and linear. Local back then, because anything that affected you was within a day's walk. If something happened on the other side of the planet, you knew nothing about it, unless it was an asteroid strike, in which case you were you know, in trouble anyway. And it was linear in that life didn't change decade to decade, century to century, millennium to millennium. It was pretty much constant. But that's not the way the world is today, right? But that's the way our cognitive biases, the wiring of our brain evolved, and the challenge is that today we're living in a world that's global and exponential. Something happens in China or India, you know about it seconds later. Your computer's about it microseconds later. Things aren't changing century to century or decade to decade. They're changing year to year. And if I were to describe it, it looks like this. And fundamentally, that red line is all of us. It's our patients. It's our boards of trustees. It's our families. It's our politicians. It's us, it's us humans. We are linear thinkers. We're not changing at any kind of an extraordinary rate. You know, we haven't had a hardware or software upgrade in 50,000 years. It's been a while. That yellow line, though, is the technology we're using. It's a technology that you're creating. It's a technology that's in the hall down, you know, in the room down the hall over here. It's a technology that SU speaks about, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, 3D printing, network sensors, you know, synthetic genomics. All of these areas are exploding onto the scene, and the rate of change is so fast. And the difference between the way that we humans are processing this information and using it, and the way that technology is coming online, is what's so extraordinary right now. And you know, if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and some kid in the garage comes up with a breakthrough concept that puts your primary product or service out of business, it's disruptive stress. If you're the kid in the garage, it's disruptive opportunity. And so that's what's going on that is so exciting. And if you know, the numbers are these, in the next 10 years, it's predicted that 40% of today's, today's Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist. And the reason for that is that the rate of change is going so fast that most large companies cannot keep up with it. Put a different way, if you look at the numbers, this is from Richard Foster at Yale, who says, if you started a company in the 1920s, you had a 67-year run rate that you could milk that company, that things didn't change. But today you start a company, and you're in the S&P 500, you've got 15 years. You know, you're MySpace, disrupted by Facebook, worried about Google+, Plus, whatever's next. And the way I look at it, and this is what gets it exciting, that's the companies, again, in the, in the room down the hall, or the, the companies that SU is incubating, the rate at which we can go from I've got an idea to I run a billion dollar company is exploding onto the scene. Right, so you've got all of these companies that are literally coming out of nowhere. You know, Chad Hurley, who starts YouTube on his credit cards and sells it for $1.6 billion to Google 18 months later. 
right? Or Palmer Lucky at Oculus VR, who does a Kickstarter campaign for $3 million and then you know, sells it to Facebook for $2 billion 18 months later. Or just think about going to the taxi fleet in San Francisco or Andy Taylor at Enterprise Rent-A-Car and saying, listen, a couple of guys and gals are going to start a, a service called Uber. They're never going to buy a single car, but they're going to take away 65% of the, of the San Francisco taxi fleet traffic and be worth $18 billion in five years. You would have thought they were nuts. But the fact of the matter is this kind of disruption is coming all the time, and it's coming from outside your normal field. So when I look at the kinds of disruption we're going to see in the healthcare space, in medicine and pharmaceuticals, it's not coming from inside these fields. It's Apple, a computer company, disrupting the music business. And it's going to be a whole slew of other technology companies disrupting the medical and pharma business. So we talk about exponentials, and this is our Singularity University headquarters campus. And I say, what does exponentials feel like? Again, when you think about it, we're linear thinkers. All of us can really do great in saying, in five steps I'll be there, in 10 steps there, in 30 steps I'll be there. We're linear projectors. We do it really well. In fact, we take anything and try and make it look linear. But if I said to you, we're going to be in 30 exponential steps, you know, 30 simple doublings, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, unless you have it memorized, and I hope you do, in 30 doublings, you'll be a billion meters away. Put differently, you will have gone around the planet 26 times. And that difference between I'll be there in 30 linear steps and circumnavigating 26 times in 30 exponential steps is really the challenge we have today because most CEOs, most people running companies are very linear thinkers. So we study this at SU. And I hope that this is, if you're, actually, I'm, I'm curious, how many of you, this is the first time you're at an, a Singularity University event, if you could raise your hand? Okay, so the majority of you. So if you're interested, we run programs for the top graduate students around the world. We have some 5,000 applicants for 80 spots, and they come for 10 weeks. And during these 10 weeks, we are teaching about all of these technologies, and our mission for them, our charge to them, our, in fact, our emphatic requirement is start a company that can impact a billion people inside of 10 years in a positive fashion. We call it 10 to the 9th plus thinking. And that's the world we're living in today, where a guy or a gal in the garage can literally start a company that can impact a billion people in 10 years. That's extraordinary. But besides our GSP, we run executive programs, in fact, we run about six or seven of these a year, not just in medicine, but across all of these areas affecting, it's a six day program, and we run program for Fortune 100, 200 companies called our Innovation Partnership Program. So let's talk about what's underlying this exponential growth. This guy over here is Gordon Moore. Uh, he's one of the founders of Intel, who in 1965 wrote this paper that said, hey, we've been noticing that for the last seven years, the number of transistors we're able to put onto an integrated circuit has been roughly doubling every 12 to 24 months. And it's our expectation that it's going to likely to continue. And that concept, that paper, got you know, sort of adopted as a basic premise of where computational power was going, and it was called Moore's Law. And I want to give you a physical manifestation of what that looks like. So this is the first integrated circuit ever produced. It's two transistors. You can see it there, half-inch feature size. And this, in 1971, was the first integrated circuit that Intel produced. 2,300 transistors, about a buck each, 740 kilohertz. Now let's fast forward 40 years. This is the NVIDIA 2012 graphical processor unit. Right, 7.1 billion transistors at a millionth of a penny per. And the difference here is a hundred billion fold improvement over 40 years. This is a physical manifestation. This is what's going on. This is why you've got a supercomputer in your pocket. Right? This is why all the crazy stuff that we are able to do with computational power right now is going on. So the question is, can this kind of growth go on forever? because we're talking about exponential growth, and the fact of the matter is, when you draw a typical exponential growth map, you've got this slow, deceptive, we'll talk about that in a moment, 
becoming disruptive, and then whatever that technology is sort of falls off. And this is called a technology S-curve. And this is what we typically see. But what happens, however, is that these technology S-curves sort of overlap each other. So Moore's law is the fifth paradigm of computational power. The first was electromechanical, and then we went into relay, and then we went into vacuum tubes, and then we went into transistors, and then finally into integrated circuits. And one of these technologies gave us the capability to build the next and the next and the next. And when you have these sort of seeded S-curves, this exponential capability continues on. And so when we talk about exponential technologies growing forever, it doesn't for one particular technology, but when it enables the next one, it continues. And so the question is, have you seen this going on in your life? And where have you seen it going on in your life? And I can have the, uh, the audio up on the slide with our AV team. Let me share with you one example of where you've seen this kind of exponential growth over and over again. Not quite that high up, but that's okay. <laughs> but you get the point, right? I mean, I, I, that bring back sort of like this sort of like this emotional experience back for like, you've got mail. I mean, it's like, oh, I finally connected, great. But we've seen this, right? We had dial up and then we had after that, we had uh, DSL and cable modems and now we've got fiber optic and Wi-Fi. I mean, in fact, we, every place we go, we expect it to be Wi-Fi. Never are we without connectivity. And if you stop and you think about that in almost every area, you're going to be having that kind of, of staggered and connected growth. So I want to share with you a couple of places just to give you a sense of the kinds of growth that we have going on. So computation is one. Obviously, here's the Osborne and here's the, two, you know, the iPhone that came out. 150,000 fold advantage over the course of those uh, 25 years. But of course, the Osborne never made phone calls and never had you know, thousands of apps for free on it. And where are we gonna go in 25 years? It's gonna be molecular. We're gonna have ubiquitous computing that's free, that's available everywhere. This sensor is, for me, one of the best stories yet. This is the first digital camera produced by Kodak. This is Steven Sesson, who produced it in, in 1976. And you can imagine he walks into the boardroom of Kodak and he shows this thing, takes 0 0.01 megapixel images. And of course, the board and the management team ignore this thing because it's, you know, they're in the paper and chemicals business and this thing is a cost center for Kodak. And you know, 19, 2012, 30 years later, Kodak files for chapter 11. And this is the Kodak, this is the digital camera today. It's a billion times better. But here's the key point I want to make. This is where it is today, right? The camera does not stop its development here because in another 10 years, it'll be 1,000 times better. 20 years later, it's a million times better. In 30 years, it's a billion times better. And what's it going to look like in that time frame? It'll be sort of high-definition imaging systems woven into every fabric, into every surface around, where everything is being imaged constantly? I think so. I really do believe so. We're going to be heading towards a time where you can know anything you want, any time you want, anywhere you want. And so that's just one sensor example. Of course, here's the first inertial measurement unit that got us to orbit, that got us to the moon. Here it is today, a buck on your phone. And of course, where is it going to be? Because again, this is where all of these things are today. They don't stop here. The rate of this kind of march of, of continuous improvement and price and performance is continuing. And in fact, it's accelerating in most cases. So it will be molecular memory, again, woven into everything, built into everything we're, we're creating. This is the first GPS unit, 100, 120,000 bucks, 53 pounds. Imagine this thing on the dashboard of your SUV. <laughs> and of course, this is where it is today. I love this example of sensors and networks, and Daniel mentioned it earlier. You know, our friends at Cisco say we're at 12 billion connected devices. We'll be at 50 billion by the end of this decade, going to you know, a trillion sensors. And every one of GE's engines flying are generating a terabit, a terabyte of data. 
GE doesn't sell the engines anymore, it leases the engine so that it can monitor what's going on and repair it before it ever breaks. And of course, I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm just wearing one little device. How many folks here are wired in some capacity or wearing something on their hands or their body? So probably more than the normal 15, 20%, but that's nothing, right? And most of us, I mean, I drive a, a Tesla and I fly an SR22 airplane with 100 processors and hundreds of sensors. My refrigerator is better wired than I am. And of course, that's all gonna change this decade and many of the companies you're gonna be seeing here at Exponential Medicine are gonna be changing that equation. And so we're gonna be entering a time where every single person is being wired and monitored by AIs and by the cloud and changing the practice of medicine. Ultimately, the way I like to think about it is making each individual the CEO of their own health. So what I'd like to do is, is talk about how I think about exponential technologies. And it's a framework I hope you'll think about all of the technologies you see and hear about uh, this, this coming next few days. So the first is that any technology that becomes digitized, manufacturing, biology, genomics, medicine, all of these things, when they become digitized, enter a period of deceptive growth, and then enter disrupt disruptive, then they dematerialize, they demonetize, and they ultimately democratize technologies. Let me explain what that means. And I think it's important because I do look at everything I study and all the companies I invest in through this framework. So the first is deception and disruption. So this is, again, us linear humans. It's our linear projectors. And if you look at the first number up there, 0 0.01, this is the Kodak camera I showed you, 0 0.01 megapixels. And what happened was it really entered a period where it became 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. And during the early days of these doublings, it all looks like zero. We humans sort of like make that look linear. And then it hits the knee of the curve and it becomes disruptive. And ultimately we end up with a 10 megapixel or you know, larger cameras today. And when it becomes disruptive, what these technologies ultimately do is they dematerialize things. And what dematerialization means is this, right? 20 years later, all of these things fit in your pocket. So I don't carry a GPS anymore. It's dematerialized onto my phone, as is a flashlight, as is an HD video camera, still camera, two-way video conferencing. All of these things have physically become bits on my phone. And my phone will ultimately dematerialize into the fabric, into the, into the, into the space that we're in. And you have to believe that most medical devices in some way, shape, or form will become, begin to dematerialize. So if you're in the manufacturing business for devices, how will you dematerialize your devices before someone else does to you? Because once they're dematerialized, they become awfully cheap, like free, and they demonetize. So Uber is demonetizing the taxi fleets, right? Taking the money out of the taxi fleets, putting it back in your pocket. It cost me, you know, 12 bucks to get from my home to LAX instead of 35 bucks in a taxi. Skype is dematerializing long distance or demonetizing long distance. Amazon, the bookstores, Google, the research libraries, Airbnb, the hotel chains, and ultimately Craigslist decimated the newspapers, took the money out of their revenue engines, out of the classifieds, and put it back into your pockets. So I think we're gonna see a tremendous amount of demonetization of healthcare this next decade. And it may not be the traditional companies that are doing it. Maybe a tech company, maybe startups here in the audience that make it so cheap and so easy that most of the large companies will not be able to compete. And when they don't, that's when we start to see that 40% of the Fortune 500 companies no longer existing, when their revenue engines are literally yanked out from underneath them. And when that happens, when these technologies become dematerialized and demonetized, they become democratized. So we're gonna have a billion handsets in Africa by 2016. And if you wanted to reach a billion people in Africa before, you had to have been, you know, Jeff Immelt at GE or Mutar Kent at Coca-Cola with arms and legs in every country and every village going out to reach them. Today, you can be an SU company literally in the lab with a great product or service reaching out to a billion people out there. That's an exciting time to be alive, right? And I think ultimately, when I talk about an abundance of healthcare, 
It's the realization that we will have the ability this next decade to provide healthcare, diagnostics at least, and in many cases services to a billion people around the world. And you can't do that with, with touch. You can't do that with human doctors and nurses. It's only way you can do that that scales is with technology. And so we're gonna be seeing tremendous change in this arena. And of course, all of this is being driven by this curve. You're gonna see this over and over again, the computational power of, and growth of, compu uh, of computer speeds. Um, and I'll just mention, you know, this is my laptop today at 100 billion calculations per second. Nine years from now, the average $1,000 you spend on a computer is now calculating at the, race of the rate of the human brain, 10 to the 16 cycles per second. And of course, 25 years later, it's calculating at the rate of the entire human race. My last slide is the following. We're heading towards a world where these faster and cheaper computers are the growth medium the foundation upon which all of these other technologies are growing. And that's what makes it so extraordinarily exciting. And when I think about the one field and the reason that Robin and Daniel and I and the whole team started Exponential Medicine is the one area that's gonna see the most disruption, the most change, is gonna be medical practice. It's gonna be the whole healthcare area around the world. It's gonna be incredibly change this next decade. So uh, I'll leave this up and, uh, and share these last three slides. This is the world's population. We just crossed the seven billion mark. This is internet penetration. In 2010, we had 1.8 billion people connected online. By 2020, it's gonna be a minimum of five billion people connected. If Facebook and Google have their way, it'll be seven billion people connected with a megabit connection each. When? These next five or six years. We're talking about three billion new minds coming online this decade. You know, what are they gonna want? What are they gonna invent? What are they gonna desire? What are they gonna purchase? They represent the greatest era of innovation ever. They represent tens of trillions of dollars flowing into the global economy. And for me, this is the huge opportunity we have with exponential medicine. If you'd like a copy of these slides, by the way, if you just text only your first name and email to that number, uh, you'll, get these, you'll get these slides. Uh, and what I'd love to do is just uh, uh, wrap by a summary that says the following. We're living during a day and age where the number of people with access to the exponential technologies that you're gonna be talking about these next three days is exploding. We're going from, again, a couple of billion to five billion people who are coming online with, you know, infinite computing, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, and what they are able to do with that, the challenges they're able to solve with that will be extraordinary.